right, that's a good sign. All right, so welcome to lecture 11 of Math 383, Complex Analysis. So what I want to do today is you know, talk about some of the key theorems in the subject. And so what you should have been doing for the last two classes is making sure that you are solid on your, for the most part, real analysis. You essentially sequences and series, you should be very good with stuff like that. You know, I've posted a bunch of uh, links to handouts and lectures. So if you are looking for more details about stuff like this, you can easily go to those for greater detail. So today we're going to prove holomorphic and analytic uh, synonyms in complex analysis. So if you say a function is holomorphic, you're really saying it's analytic or vice versa. Can somebody tell me right now, what does the word holomorphic mean in complex analysis? Differentiable. What does analytic mean? Taylor series expansion exists and agrees with the function. One direction is very easy between holomorphic implies analytic or analytic implies holomorphic. Which is the easy direction? Yeah, analytic implies holomorphic, right? Because you can prove using analysis techniques, which you are all making sure you're comfortable with, that you can differentiate term by term inside the radius of convergence of a sequence. And so if the series exists, then we can differentiate term by term and it's differentiable. All right, so you did one half, I'll do the other half. I think that's a fair division of labor. We're gonna prove the accumulation theorem that if you have a function that is holomorphic and it has a sequence of zeros that accumulate at a point inside the space where it's differentiable, then the function is identically zero. This is extremely different than real analysis. Uh, and this formula has tremendous applications. We will then prove Liouville's theorem. And Liouville's theorem says that if you have a holomorphic function defined on the entire complex plane that's bounded, then it has to be constant. Again, very different than real analysis. As a rule of thumb, if you want to get a sense of what's true in complex analysis, just negate results from real analysis. Completely different behavior. As an application of Liebel's theorem, and we were talking about this a little bit before class began, we will prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. Yeah, I'm going to confidently assert that you did not see a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra back when you were in middle school or high school. Uh, it's long overdue if you've not seen this. You, know, you do not get the title fundamental lightly. And so this is extremely important. It says that, depending on how you want to phrase it, if you have a polynomial with complex coefficients of degree n, it has n complex traits. All right, uh, you should also watch you know, a couple of videos. Um, I've just put the links here and I will, these also on the homepage. Again, these are just more integration examples. Um, one of the nice things is with all the videos and all the stuff like this, we don't have to do all the examples in class. If there are things that you are seeing that you would like more detail, let me know and I'm happy to do more in class. I'm happy to meet with you. The TA is happy to meet with you. And speaking of meeting, it is a beautiful, gorgeous day. I do not know how much longer Lickety will be open. So if anybody is interested, there will be a Lickety run at 2.45 today. Uh, if you're not able to come, I will eat ice cream in your honor and think of you. All right, so let's just quickly review some results we have from before. So the first is, whose theorem is this? Cauchy, it's either Cauchy or 4.1, it's Cauchy. So, <laughs> Cauchy showed that if F is holomorphic in an open set that contains the closure of a disk and C is the boundary circle with the positive orientation, then F of Z is given as one over two pi I, the integral over C of F of zeta over zeta minus Z D zeta. So if we have a holomorphic function, once we specify it on the boundary circle, we actually know its values in the interior. Absolutely amazing. It's completely determined by its value in this lower dimensional set. There were a lot of applications of this. One was uh, that we can calculate the derivative of f, and we also have an integral representation. And what you might notice is that the power of the zeta minus z down below is one higher than the derivative we're taking. And in fact, what we did up here is just a special case, it's just the n equals zero case. And we talked about why that was true last time. 
And then we mentioned the Cauchy inequalities. You know, this is a good band of day for Cauchy. If f is holomorphic, then the nth derivative is bounded by n factorial times the supremum. That's basically the largest value of f on the circle of radius c divided by r to the n. Now, when we have something like this, we typically fix an n and we'll often let the radius get larger and larger and larger. So this n factorial doesn't really bother me because the n factorial is independent of the radius. It's independent of the function. What I really care about is how does the growth of this bound change as I take circles with large and larger radii? I know what's happening in the denominator. As r gets larger, the denominator gets bigger, so I'm dividing by ever large amounts. But what I'm getting from this is I can bound the derivative at z naught by knowing things about how large is the function far away from z along a circle. I can pass that information. And so we can jump a little bit ahead. We've got the formula staring at us right over here. What if you knew that the function was bounded? What could you tell me about the first derivative? It's zero because the function is defined on the entire complex plane. So if we know that the function is bounded, its first derivative is identically zero. What about its second derivative? Third derivative. All of its derivatives are zero. So you have two ways to prove that this function now is constant. One is all of its derivatives are zero at z naught. We know it has a Taylor series expansion because we're going to prove that analytic and holomorphic are the same. Therefore, it must be identically zero. I'm sorry, it must be constant. The other approach is to say the first derivative is identically zero. If the first derivative is identically zero, the only way that can happen is if the function is constant. And so we could just do this argument for every point z naught in our space. And so try to make those rigorous. Those are two different ways of trying to prove that the function has to be constant. Either if the first derivative is zero everywhere, it's going to be constant. Or if all the derivatives of z naught are zero. And you might have to worry about, do we have the same Taylor series expansion that holds at every point? So try to make this argument rigorous. And I'm always happy to look at you know, write-ups of this. OK, so now we want to prove that holomorphic implies analytic. OK? So it turns out that the proof comes from uh, nice algebra. Right? So a function is analytic at z0 if I can write it as a sum of a n z minus z0 to the n. And here, the sum is going to go from 0 to infinity. Why am I not allowing n to be things like negative 5 or negative 6? I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a singular. It would blow up. It would have a pull. And when we get to chapter 3, which will probably be on Wednesday, you will talk about you know, poles and where functions blow up. So my function has to start at n equals 0 in my expansion. And so. This is just standard Taylor series. A n is the nth derivative at z naught divided by n factorial. This way, when you take n derivatives, z minus z naught to the n, when you take n derivatives, the n factorial comes down and cancels over here. That's why a n has this n factorial down below. What's the most pleasant coefficient to look at? Where you're least likely to make a mistake. Mm. Not zero. <laughs> one. Because then if you forget the n factorial, you're fine. Zero would also work because zero factorial is one. Uh, but you know, again, a lot of times people forget where the n factorial is. They put it in the wrong spot. You've got to remember that a n is the nth derivative divided by n factorial. If you remember your multivariable calculus, which is dangerous to ask, you might remember about parametrizing curves, and you sometimes have to divide by the norm of the tangent vector. So this is why we do unit speed parametrization, because then what is the norm of the tangent vector? One. And then it doesn't matter if we forget to divide by it, because it's one. OK? So the key idea in proving that holomorphic is analytic is to do nothing. So what are the two ways we can do nothing? Multiply by one and add 0. So today, it's an add by 0. 
right? So we write zeta minus z as zeta minus z naught plus z naught minus z. So I've just added z minus z naught minus z naught or negative z naught plus z naught. So we're adding zero. So negative z naught plus z naught. And now I'm going to just group things together. So zeta minus z naught minus z minus z naught. The reason I want to do this is we're trying to understand the function near the point z naught. So I want to expand about the point z naught. So I've got zeta minus z. Well, I don't really care about how far z is from zeta. I care about how far it is from z naught. So I want to have a z minus z naught coming in. I can't just throw in a negative z naught unless I add it back in. And now what we do is we pull out the zeta minus z naught. And so when we pull that out, we would get one minus z minus z naught over zeta minus z naught. So a lot of mathematics is pattern recognition. Does this second part look like anything to you? What does it look like? Yeah, looks like a geometric series. And here I would just be z minus z naught over zeta minus z naught. Now, you should always be careful because this is a math department, this is not a physics department. What should we be careful about right now? The quantity's gotta be less than one. Okay, so one thing is we definitely want this quantity to be less than one. Well, if z is close to z naught, that should, that should be okay. What else do we have to be careful about? Sorry? Wait, we have to be careful about what if zeta equals z naught? Then we'd be dividing by zero. Well, if zeta equals z naught, then that would mean z naught would have to be on the circle because zeta lives on the circle. And since z naught is inside the circle, we can do this. z naught is an arbitrary point inside the circle. So we have this beautiful expansion and we can expand this out. So we know f of z is one over two pi i integral of f of z over zeta minus z. We proved that. And we know the nth derivative. This works for any point. I, I, I plugged in z, but there's another point I could have plugged in. What could I have plugged in instead? I could plug in z naught. And we haven't used green yet today. So let's replace that with z naught. And let's replace that with z naught. It just go through Cauchy's argument. Instead of using z, use the letter z naught. It's not a big deal. So we know formula for the nth derivative at z naught. We know f of z is equal to the following. OK, so hopefully this will work. Yes, it did work. Excellent. All right, so we now have f of z is 1 over 2 pi i integral um, over the region, you know, it's probably going to be a disk. Okay. And so now we can write that this is going to be one over two pi i integral of our region f of zeta over zeta minus z naught. And then we have that geometric series, right? So it's going to be one plus z minus z naught over zeta minus z naught plus z minus z naught over zeta minus z naught squared plus dot 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 d zeta. Is everybody comfortable with that? I've just substituted. Well, this is the same as one over two pi i, the integral, uh, the sum n goes from zero to infinity of might have been of f of zeta over zeta minus z naught to the n plus one times z minus z naught to the n d zeta. I'm just and because I have an extra zeta minus z naught, that's why this power is one higher. What should I do now? Switch the order of integration. And you might say, what, what do you mean order of integration? A sum is really like an integral, right? It's just more 
So I want to say the integral of the sum is the sum of the integral. Okay. And so if we do that, and we'll talk about a justification of that in a moment, this is going to be um, the sum n goes from zero to infinity, one over two pi i, the integral of f of zeta over zeta minus z naught to the n plus one d zeta, z minus z naught to the n. What does that integral equal? Almost. No, not f of z naught. The derivative, which derivative? The nth derivative, right? You know, z minus z naught to the n. And so the only thing that's left is we have to justify the integral of the sum is the sum of the integral. So again, it's worth noting where are we using results in calculus? And so one of the nice things about being a professional mathematician is you talk to other professional mathematicians and you learn to just wave your hand. And you use the words like standard. Yes, that was a nice cute hand wave. Do we also have to verify that this series converges to f of z for each z in the disk? Well, we, we actually know that this is f of z because we've started off with f of z equals that expression. And so we've kept the equality throughout. And so we have to just justify formally this application of Fubini's theorem. Now, one of the things that's helping us is if z is very close to z naught, the z minus z naught to the end is going to be very small. Do we know anything about zeta minus z naught? Absolutely, it's the previous. Well, maybe z naught is over here. It's bounded. So zeta minus z naught can't be too small. So we would have zeta minus z naught is greater than some delta, which is greater than zero, because it's not on the boundary. So I know this denominator can't be too small. I mean, it can't be too small. The smaller this is, the larger it makes things. And in fact, I can make that by z sufficiently close to z naught, I can make this much, much smaller than that. And now I have f of zeta. How big can f of zeta be? Well, we have a continuous function and a bounded set on a compact set. What do we know from real analysis? It's bounded. So we actually know that these integrals can't be too large. And so if you go through, you should be able to show that everything is going to converge. And then you can justify uh, doing all the interchanges. So there's a little bit of work that you have to do to justify this. And I'm just trying to show you, but everything is gonna converge beautifully. And so all the standard results will be fine. As long as Z is sufficiently close to Z naught, then we're gonna be within the range of the power series you know, converging and we can do everything we want to. It's extremely important that the function f is holomorphic, but it doesn't blow up. So normally, what are the steps to justify the, you know, changing the order of integrals? So th this is the Fubini or the fubini tonelli theorem. I don't want to go through that in detail right now. Um, there's you know, whole slews of you know, stuff in analysis where they go through the justifications, also justifying interchanging a derivative and an integral. Yes. So I mean, what you can often do is you break the C, break the infinite sum up, and then see what is the error. And so, for instance, I mean, the way I would probably do it because everything is so nice is take the sum up to say capital N, and then show that the integral from capital N plus one onward is extremely small from all those terms, and then take the limit as capital N goes to infinity. So if I had to write things up rigorously, that's how I would do this. There is a higher level of results where you can just interchange the orders of integrals. So uh, the Fubini theorem would be if the double integral, and first, you know, integral sum is a double integral. 
if the double integral of the absolute value is finite, then you can interchange orders. So if I put an absolute value, so if everything is finite, then we're okay. And if you put an absolute values, well, everything we're doing, we're doing these absolute value estimates. So that's not a big deal. So the Fubini theorem, Fubini Tonelli, uh, would work here because the you know double integral of the absolute value is finite, and then we can switch the orders. Yes. Why can't zoom out the on the circle? Yes. We're we're trying to expand about some point inside. And so if Z0 were on the circle, then all of a sudden we have trouble. Now, if you look at the you know, initial formula for what we're integrating, you know, there is no Z0 initially. We're choosing to expand about some point. And if that point is on the boundary of the region, then we have trouble. Okay. So the next is, let's uh, suppose that F is a holomorphic function what could I have said instead? I could have now said analytic. Yeah. It's so nice no longer having to be careful. So F could be an analytic function in a region omega that vanishes on a sequence of distinct points with a limit point in omega. Then F is identically zero. So I'll prove the theorem first, and then we'll talk about why we care. Or maybe should we do the other way? Yeah. So, Let's say we have assume so assume f is not identically zero. We can write f of z as a sum n goes from zero to infinity of a n z minus z naught to the n. Okay. And so instead of using Z naught, I'm gonna use a different letter. I'm going to use Z star, where F of ZK equals zero, and the limit as K goes to infinity of ZK equals Z star. Okay, so I have a sequence of points where my function is zero, okay? And in the sequence of points, it has a limit. And we'll call that limit z star. What must be true about f of z star? Why? By continuity. We don't need to use any results from complex analysis. You know, I have a continuous function. It's zero along a sequence of points that this is essentially the definition of, okay, so we know f of z star is zero by continuity. So we have the series expansion. Does everyone agree that if all the ans are zero, then f is identically zero? So what we're going to do is we'll show that f is identically zero in a neighborhood of z star. Okay, so we're gonna just show it's identically zero in a neighborhood of z star. And there's some results from real analysis that you need to extend it to everywhere. We'll just focus on that one small place. So claim F is identically zero near Z star. And the proof is not so bad. If all a n equals zero, we're done, right? If every a n equals zero, then clearly the function is identically zero. So what's the only case left? If, if we don't have the case when every a n is zero, what must happen? It's one non-zero, at least one. At least one. So else at least one a n does not equal zero, say a sub n is the first. So if there's at least one index that's not zero, there has to be something that's the first index that's not zero. So then we can write f of z is, you know, a n z minus z star to the n 
plus a n plus one, z minus z naught, I'm sorry, z star, to the n plus one plus dot dot dot. So what I can do is I can factor things out. A n z minus z star to the n, one plus a n plus one over a n z minus z star plus dot dot dot. I can just factor out the a n z to the n plus z to the n. Oh, I'm sorry, the a n z minus z star to the n. Could a n be zero? No, we've assumed a n is not zero. So this is one plus a n plus one over a n z minus z star plus dot 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 dot. What should be true about that term in parentheses as z gets closer and closer and closer to z star? Bless you. It goes to one, right? We have a series that converges and you know, all the terms, except for the first are going to zero. I mean, really what I've done is I've just taken my sequence and I've divided by a n. That's not gonna change anything really. And I've just pulled out a z minus z star to the n. That's not gonna really change anything. So as z gets closer and closer and closer to z star, this factor here is gonna to converge to one. Why is this a problem? So why is that a problem? Yes. Yeah, we, we have a sequence of points converging to Z star where it's zero. But now we've just shown that the only place close to Z star where it's zero is what? Is Z star. This means you know only point near Z star where f vanishes is z star contradiction. We assumed we had a sequence of points converging and we've just shown that that can't happen. And there's the proof. Okay, uh, so two comments. Uh, first, let's let f of x be x squared. Well, let's make it x cubed. And feeling generous, sine of one over x. This function is clearly differentiable. This function has infinitely many zeros and where do those zeros accumulate? They accumulate at zero. So this tells you, you know, yet again, Real analysis is very different than complex analysis. I can give you a real variable function where I have a sequence that accumulates, but the function is not identically zero. What can you tell me about the function z cubed sine of one over z? What must be true about the function z cubed sine of one over z? is not holomorphic. Because if it was holomorphic, then if it has a sequence of points where it accumulates, it would have to be identically zero, and it's not. So we know immediately that z cubed sine of one over z is not complex differentiable. You know, I love these elephant gun proofs, right? Now there's something else that's very valuable about this. Say f of z equals g of z for all z k with the limit as k goes to infinity of z k equals z star in the region. Then what must be true? f equals g. So if you have two complex valued functions that equal each other along a sequence that accumulates, the only way that can happen is if they're the same. Is that true in real analysis? 
can you give me an example of two functions that equal along a sequence that accumulates but are not identically the same? Yeah, exactly. The, the function that's right on the board, right? So again, complex analysis is very different than real analysis. If I can prove two functions are the same along a sequence that accumulates, right? Who are my physicists or potential physicists? If you've never read the paper, can you hear the shape of a drum that's worth Googling and reading? And so you know, the question is, if you hear just the vibrational frequencies, is that enough to uniquely specify the drum? And there's a lot of problems like that. You know, if I give you the spectrum, you know, the eigenvalues of a certain operator, is that enough to uniquely determine the operator? So we have stuff like this. I have a sequence of zeros. In probability, how many of you have taken probability? If I tell you two distributions have the same integer moments, must they be the same? And the answer is no. It's not enough to know that they're the same along integer moments. We will see later in the semester how complex analysis can come to the rest of it. All right. I am, yes. So for the, for the, uh, well, because if it was holomorphic, we know when z is just the real variable x, yeah. that this is equal to zero infinitely often as we get closer and closer and closer to zero. Oh, okay. But that function is not identically zero. Therefore, z cubed sine of one over z can't be holomorphic. Gotcha. You could actually go through and take z to be imaginary, and you'll see that it actually explodes near the origin. But there's no need to do that. The accumulation theorem is a wonderful backdoor uh, proof of this. So I am not going to go through the remainder of the proof that you need to use from real analysis. You know, this is in the book and I will just paste this here. Uh, this is just where we need to use some results from early analysis. It's not a big deal if you haven't seen this and are not comfortable with it. I just want to flag it for making sure that our proofs are rigorous. What we did is we proved that near Z star, the function is identically zero. We then want to expand it outward. And the idea is basically wherever you are, you can always keep pushing the boundary a little bit further. And if you couldn't go all the way, I can show I can go a little bit further. All right. That's all I want to say about that. So what I want to do now is talk about Liouville's theorem. If f is entire and bounded, then f is constant. Well, we actually already did this. I want to copy this and move this down to here. I mean, sometimes my handwriting is actually very neat and easy to read, right? And so we have two possibilities. So one, yes. What does it mean if f is entire? Oh, so an entire uh, holomorphic on all of C. So it means it's differentiable everywhere. So proof one, um, holomorphic equals analytic, all derivatives equals zero for n greater than or equal to one. So Taylor series is f of z equals a zero. So we, we talked about that all the derivatives have to be zero from one, two, three, four, five, and on. The second proof, uh, for all z naught, f prime of z naught, double z naught, equals zero, so f prime is identically zero, so f is constant. So you just want to show if I have a function that's identically zero. Now notice this is a little bit different than some of the troublesome examples we have in real analysis. So you should always remember you know, this painful example, g of x is e to the negative one over x squared. If x is not zero and zero otherwise. So if I give you this function, all of the derivatives of this function at zero are zero. So at time zero, you're at zero, your speed is zero, your acceleration is zero. What's the rate of change of the acceleration called? The jerk, your jerk is zero. Yes, we can actually quantify how much of a jerk you have. Anybody know what comes beyond jerk? What is it? 
<laughs> I, I forget what it, I forget what it's called. There, there was a um, name for at least the four. from oh. Zoom. Yes. Yeah, I believe it goes Snap Crackle Pop because they yes, that, that sounds right. Cereals. Snap Crackle yeah. Pop. Yes, yes, yes. Snap Crackle Pop does sound right. Yes. And so, in that function, all of the derivatives are zero at zero, but the function is not identically zero. This should bother you, right? I'm not moving. I'm not accelerating. I'm not. I'll stop it. And so nothing. Ch Nothing is changing at the origin. Everything is zero, yet I move. Galileo would be so proud. Okay. Complex analysis show that if f prime is identically zero, then f has to be, has to be constant. So it shouldn't be too bad to show that that's a nice thing to try to show. Okay. What are solutions to polynomials with different spaces of coefficients? So for example, Let's say I give you um, f of x is you know ax plus b, where a, b are integers. What can you tell me about the solutions? I'm sorry? OK, but where did, where did the solutions live? What kind of numbers? Rationals. So. This implies x is in q, not necessarily in z. So just because I have integer coefficients doesn't mean I will have integer roots. OK, so what if I now give you, say, f of x is um, r1 x squared plus r2, where r1 and r2 are rational. Will I always have rational solutions? No, what will I have? Right. So it depends on what on what um, R2 and R are, right? So I, so let's do, for instance, you know, r one x squared plus r two with r one greater than zero, r two less than zero. What would you have now? We would have real. Um, don't you? Uh, this is from Zoom. Yep. Uh, don't you have that? It's either like strictly imaginary or strictly real. In in this case, yes, because things are very special. Uh, but we could do, for instance, you know, x squared plus one. That would give us x is in C, or actually x, as you would say, is in I times R. And so if I have a polynomial with real coefficients, I don't necessarily have real roots. But what's amazing is if I give you f of z is, you know, a n z to the n plus dot 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 plus a zero, with the a k in C, then it has n roots in C. I don't have to keep adding more stuff. You know, if I had polynomials with integer coefficients, I needed to expand to the rationals. If I had polynomials with rationals, I had to extend to the reals, even to the complexes. So the high level executive summary Square root of negative one equals i is enough. Once we incorporate the square root of negative one, there's no need to introduce other things. Where is the square root of negative one coming from? It's coming from this polynomial, x squared plus one. Once we put in its solution, we don't need to do anything else. That's really nice. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do anything else. You can, of course, extend to the quaternions, uh, to the Octonians, and you can keep going further and further and further. And you know these systems have, shall we say, some interesting properties. I will skip that for now. All right? Every non-constant polynomial with complex coefficients has a root in C. This is almost the fundamental theme of, of, uh, of algebra. What's the difference between this and the fundamental theme of algebra? It has n roots. 
So my claim is that once you have one root, you're done by lather, rinse, repeat. You know, once you have one root, it's gonna be divisible by Z minus your root. And now you have a polynomial of one degree lower. And you then just you're done by induction. If I have a polynomial of odd degree, it's very easy to prove it has a real root. Because if it has odd degree, it's going to plus infinity in one direction, minus infinity in another. So the difficulty in trying to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra was, okay, if it's an odd polynomial, we know we have a root that reduces to, unfortunately, an even degree polynomial, which may not have a root. Can someone give me a polynomial of even degree that has no real roots? X yeah, X squared plus, plus one. one right? You know, whenever possible, let's try to be efficient and keep using the same functions again and again. So X squared plus one. So this is why you know, some of the standard approaches have trouble because when you try to reduce, unfortunately we could reduce to a situation where we don't necessarily have a root. All right, so we want to show that there's at least one root because once we have one root, we're done. Okay, so everybody's comfortable that we just have to find one root. All right, so we're gonna do a proof by contradiction. Assume not. Um, and why do you think I'm using P of Z rather than F of Z? Polynomial, right? So we'll assume that P of Z is never zero. So we can write P of Z as, you know, a n z to the n plus dot 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 plus a zero, where a n does not equal zero. This is going to be the leading degree of our polynomial. I can write this uh, very similar to what we've done before, a n z to the n, one plus a n minus one over a n um, one over z plus a n minus two over a n one over z squared plus dot 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 plus a zero over a n one over z to the n. Okay. As n gets very, very large, what can you tell me about all the different terms? I'm sorry, as z gets large. So yes. So as z goes to infinity, one over z, one over z squared, dot 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 go to zero. So the sum is at most n times the maximum of a n minus k over a n times one over the absolute value of z. And by the sum, I mean of those terms. And the reason is I have n terms each term is one over z to a power and a ratio of the a's. Let's take whichever ratio is largest and let's use that every single time. And let's take whichever one of the one over z is the smallest. Well, since z is going to infinity, the smallest one is gonna be one over z. So eventually this will be less than one in absolute value, right? If the absolute value of z is large, this is less than one in absolute value. So P of Z is not zero, right? And in fact, in fact, the absolute value of P of Z would be greater than or equal to one half a n Z to the n in absolute value. Because this expression is going to zero, so eventually it has to be less than one half. And even if it was as bad as one half, if I subtracted that from one, then that would have to be at least one half. So P of Z has to be at least one half a n over Z to the n. Okay, so now that we have that, yes. I'm sorry? Uh, Wait, I'm, I'm saying just the stuff in the red parentheses. Right, but you said the entire thing is bounded by one over two. Is that the two? Well, 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 the stuff in parentheses here is at least one half. 
So this is a lower bound. Oh, oh, right. So it's a lower bound. It's a lower bound. You know, the absolute value of p of z is at least one half a n z to the n. So we can flip this around, and so we would get um, one over p of z is going to be less than or equal to two over a n z to the n. Right. Do I have to worry about one over p of z? Why not? By hypothesis is okay. So not zero by hypothesis. And now as z gets really, really large, what can you tell me about two over a n z to the n? Zero, goes to zero. So clearly this is gonna be less than or equal to b for some b. Why is it less than or equal to b? Well, as z gets very, very large, we agree that this is going to zero, correct? So eventually, at some point, it's going to be less than one in absolute value, right? And if you take a circle, and beyond that circle, it's at most one in absolute value, inside that circle, it has to have a largest value. And so inside that circle, it's got to have a largest value. Call that value B, or take the largest of that value in one. So we know that this function has to be bounded. So what do we know about a bounded function? And it is a polynomial in time. So we get uh, P of Z. 1 over p of z is uh, constant. And that's a contradiction. We assumed we had a polynomial. A polynomial is going to be. I technically, I didn't prove that p is constant. I only proved 1 over p is constant. Yeah, I, I think we can leave that as an exercise, yes. I, so we have that p has to be constant, but p is not constant, therefore a contradiction. And then just you know, for completeness, you know, the, the full general fundamental theorem of algebra is that we now have uh, any polynomial of degree n has n complex roots if the coefficients are complex. If the coefficients are real, the roots occur in complex conjugate pairs. Yes? If like one over is constant, and still not be constant. Well, no, no, it's not that it's upper bounded by a constant. So what we initially proved is we proved that this function is bounded. And then we use Liouville's theorem. Liouville tells us that if a function is bounded and entire, then it has to be constant. So we're using Liouville to show that not only is it constant, no, I'm sorry, not only is it bounded, but it actually improves to being constant. And then, of course, uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra is uh, we can just lather rinse repeat. And once we know that there's one root, we remove that out, and then we keep playing the game, and everything is fully factored. So this is absolutely wonderful. We've now gotten up to your eighth grade math. Yes? Did you will have the condition for that it needs to be bounded? I would think so. You've got to be careful, because a lot of things are not named after the person. Uh, who did them. So this is for my physicist, and we'll stop here. Um, you know, I, I apologize for crappy drawing. Does anybody know what this looks like? Electromagnetic radiation, right? You have your magnetic field and you have your electric field. Does anybody know about the pointing vector? What does the pointing vector tell you? Direction. The direction of energy transfer. And how do you spell pointing? That is the person's name. It's like, I'm going to study something, and by God, I'm going to make sure that they don't name it after someone else. And so I still remember as a freshman, you know, we all, you know, the professor's like, okay, this is the pointing vector. Wait. 
you know, because our professor was British, so we were wondering, is this a British spelling? <laughs> no, no, this is the person's name. The person's name is Poynton. All right, so this is a good place to stop.